we've been on a series, a sermon series, I've been writing called Essentials, and today we're continuing that today. We're going to talk about essential worship. And that video makes a great statement. Worship really is so much more than just a song, isn't it? Music is an avenue. It's a tool that we use when we worship God. And that was also very much the case in Scripture. So music is a wonderful gift, but in and of itself, it is not worship. <clears throat> when we do gather, though, and sing songs of praise, and we earnestly worship together, with music, when we worship God together, it can be a very powerful expression of our love, and it's why I love it so much. There's nothing better than worshiping with God's people. Do you know that when the preacher is standing up here in the pulpit, teaching the Word of God to the congregation, the Lord isn't sitting up in heaven with his Bible open, following along. That teaching is directed to us. It's for our edification. When we attend Sunday school or a Wednesday night Bible study, that's directed to us. That's for our edification. It's for building us up. When our kids go to kids' programs, our teens go to youth church, our ladies and men meet for men's and women's ministries, those events are directly for our edification. They're for building us up. But when we gather for a few minutes on a Sunday morning and lift our voices in concert to the praise and glory and honor and worship of God, that is directly for Him. We may be edified and built up in the process, and we should be. The Word says that, and it, it's great. But worship is one of the few things that we do in church on a Sunday that is directly focused on God rather than us. There are some other functions that serve in that capacity. Water baptism. Uh, we just recently witnessed that. Communion, um, which we're going to share in today as an act of worship. But most of what we do corporately is for our direct edification. And that isn't wrong. We're supposed to come together and be equipped and built up in the church. As the church. Ephesians 4.12 tells us that. 1 Corinthians 14.1-5. 1 Corinthians 14.26 says, What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So it is important that we're being edified and built up as the church. And the truth is, anytime we dedicate ourselves to building one another up in the Lord and in His Word, that is a form of worship. So you can make the case, and many do, that everything that we do in church is a type of worship, and I'm okay with that. However, it does not nor will it ever take the place of deliberately taking time to set everything else aside, clearing our minds of the noise of this world, and worshiping God with abandon. There are many, many examples of that in Scripture throughout the wanderings of Israel, the lives of the prophets and kings, and certainly in the New Testament church. This subject of worship is of the utmost importance to me. And maybe not for the reasons you might think. I'm in my 20th year of leading worship uh, at churches, music. I've been a musician and a singer basically my entire life. Obviously, I love music, but that fact has a little bearing on the significance of worship in my own life. That video we just watched says worship is more than a song. That may be the understatement of the century. Yet our contemporary church culture in our country has created an ethos of consumerism. A culture of consumerism that is pervasive in the American church and it's spilled over into our understanding and even our definition of the meaning of terms like pastor and worship. In the Bible, the word pastor, which means shepherd, is used once in the New Testament in Ephesians 4.11. However, throughout the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts... The word shepherd in the form of a verb is used to describe the activity or function of the elders or the overseers of the church. So elders and overseers are interchangeable terms used to describe those that shepherd or pastor the congregation. So to be biblically accurate, I'm an elder or an overseer of the church because I shepherd or pastor the congregation. For years, my official title at church is where I, wherever I was working was worship pastor. And of course, most people understand what that meant, what we meant by that. But the reality is I can't pastor the worship, can I? I can only pastor people. So I direct the music or the worship and I pastor people as an elder in the local church. The difference in those terms 
in the usage of that in church today is really fine. As long as we understand what it truly means to function in the role of an elder or an overseer or what we now call pastor, which is fine. The same is true for the function of worship. The modern Christian church and other uh, pseudo-religious organizations have turned what we refer to as worship today into a nearly billion dollar industry. And don't understand me, I'm all for Christian artists. We just sent our kids to Winter Jam to, to get their ears blown off. I'm all for Christian artists. I am recording their music. They ship it out all over the world. I've been recording original Christian music for years and peddling it to anybody who will buy it just to recoup my studio fees. I've never made a dime, but I have CDs I've recorded. I'm, I'm fine. I think it's great. So much Christian music floating around is wonderful. It's, I want my kids to listen to it of all genres. It's available in mass today. I think that's a good thing. The problem in my estimation is that we've come to associate worshiping God with something that we do for 25 to 30 minutes on Sunday morning to the tune of a few songs and then worship is over because of this culture we've created. Without a doubt, those 25 to 30 minutes are very important and I can certainly set the tone for everything else that worship can set the tone for everything else we do on this day that we come together each week. But to accept that the extent of our worship to God is encapsulated in a one-half-hour block of time once a week is at best a gross misunderstanding of the expectation and example set before us in Scripture on the true meaning and practice of worship. Okay? So that's where we're coming from today in this message. 30 minutes of worshiping Jesus once a week isn't nearly enough. Okay? Okay? We need to do more. What does that mean? What is enough? How do, we, how do we get this right? All right? So let's talk about essential worship, and we're going to start by defining what worship is. What is worship? In his book, The Reward for Worship, Pastor Jack Hayford talks about a worship renewal that he says is now occurring in the church, and he lists both what it is and what it isn't about in his estimation. Hayford says, I'm quoting from his book, he says, it isn't about music. It isn't about becoming contemporary. It isn't about cultural awareness. It isn't about being cool or hip or with it. It isn't about misty-eyed intimacy with God. It isn't about theological accuracy about God. But it is about the formation of hearts in the presence of God. It is about the shaping of disciples who know him through being with him. It is about the transforming work of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit achieves when pure worship occurs, and it is about preparation for the last battle. That's a good list. I think that's good. If I had to try and sum up what true worship is in one sentence, I would say that worship is a response to the revelation of God and the invitation by God to commune with Him. Worship is a response to the revelation of God and, and the invitation by God to commune with Him. All of our worship occurs, true worship, because He reveals Himself to us first and He invites us to worship Him. Without His leading, without His invitation, we would not know what it is to commune with God, to worship God, or even to experience salvation. Our worship is always a response to God. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, if you want to turn there, and we'll have it up on the screen. I'm all for putting scriptures on the screen, by the way. That's why we do it. I think it's great. I would much rather hold my Bible. I don't know why. There's something about holding it for me that I like, probably because I grew up that way. But I have to hold this microphone, so I put them in my notes. But if you would like to turn there, Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. 19 says... Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, in other words, we can now enter into communion and worship God, verse 20, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, okay, so this communion and worship is available to us only because of him revealing himself to us. Verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. These last two verses speak to the way in which we are to worship, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But clearly we can see that our access and ability to worship God comes from Him revealing Himself to us. 
Okay, in first John, excuse me, in John 6:44, Jesus says, "No one can come to me unless the Father who sent him or who sent me draws him." Excuse me, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, okay? So worship is a response to the revelation of God and the invitation by God to commune with him. We'll move to the next point. Number two, who do we worship? That should be an easy answer. We worship Yahweh, the one true God of heaven and earth. Exodus 20, the first commandment says, You shall have no other gods before me. This was given to his own people. Think about that a minute. Why is that? You shall have no other gods before me. He's giving this commandment to his own people. God's own people were led out of Egypt miraculously. They followed a pillar of fire by night and smoke by day. They drank water from a rock and ate manna from heaven. Surely these people understood that Yahweh was the one true God. So why did he have to tell them, you shall have no other gods before me? Because they're human beings, that's why. And despite our relationship with the creator God, the one true God, it's possible for us to make idols, just as we saw in the video. False gods out of anything that becomes a greater priority in our life than following Jesus Christ. We're God's people, and we're susceptible, just like the Israelites were, to idol worship instead of true, pure worship of the one true God. And it seems simple and obvious to say we worship Jesus Christ, but I would submit to you today that many of us at times in our lives devote ourselves to worshiping all sorts of things, material and otherwise, in place of Jesus. I've been guilty of that in my own life. We have to be very careful in our relationships that no earthly relationship supersedes our communion with the Holy Spirit. It can be career, possessions, emotions, circumstances. You can fill in the blank. There, there are many areas of our lives that can become idol worship if we don't remain disciplined and accountable. Okay? And another interesting point here is that often the temptation to devote ourselves to something other than Jesus comes in times of abundance and blessing. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11 if you, if you would like. We're going to read verses 8 through 17. Deuteronomy 11. This passage is part of a, an extended speech that Moses is giving to the Israelites in the plains of Moab. This is just after their 40-year wilderness experience and just before they take possession of the promised land. So they're in this sort of place of transition, okay? Verse 8, You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land that you're going over to possess, and that you may live long in the land and the Lord, that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land that you're entering to take possession of it's not like the land of Egypt from which you've come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. But the land that you're going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of this year, of the year. This is like a sweet piece of real estate that God's getting ready to give to his people. Right? Verse 13, And if you will indeed obey my commands that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. And he will give grass in your fields for your livestock and you shall eat and be full. In other words, God says, if you obey my commands and worship me only, I'm going to pour out many blessings on you. Verse 16, Listen, take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. They've just been through 40 years in the desert. They're getting ready to take the promised land. He says, take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain. And the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. Listen, church. Abundance always carries warnings in Scripture. Bless God for abundance and blessing. Bless God for material blessings. It's wonderful. 
Abundance always carries warnings. Take care lest your heart be deceived. What happens when everything else falls apart? Nothing is going our way and hope is lost. Seems to be. Generally, that's when we tend to press in toward God, to look to Him, and devote ourselves to that relationship. It's when everything seems perfect, when we're sort of fat and happy, and we have the world by the tail, everything's going our way, that we usually are more inclined to go astray, because we feel we don't need God. This passage should be a warning for all of us today. Take care, lest your heart be deceived, okay? The entire 13th chapter of Deuteronomy is a warning against giving in to, to temptations or false gods, idols. Anything that we're devoted to above and beyond our relationship with Jesus is an idol, a false god. Anything. Luke 4, 8, Jesus said, You shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. So who do we worship? Of course, it's the one true God. Not many church folks would argue with that point. It's the him only part that we sometimes struggle with. It's the him only part that I struggle with. It's easy to let other things creep in and become idols before we know it. And someone said, I was at a Bible study last night. The enemy rarely comes in with a baseball bat and whacks us over the head. It's a great analogy. He just drips water on your forehead until he wears you down. Take care lest your heart be deceived. Number three, okay, why do we worship? First, we worship him because he commands it. We just read Luke 4, 8. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. God's command for us to worship him is clear. And it's repeated often throughout scripture. It is his will and his design for his creation to worship him. My wife, Mary Beth, came up and read Psalm 96. That whole psalm. He's talking about our salvation and our redemption and the, and the purpose of it, to bring him glory. He created us to praise and worship him, okay? Because he commands it. Second, because God delights in our worship. Psalm 149, I'll read the first four verses. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. God delights in us when we worship him. This is what we were talking about earlier. This is why we praise, why praise and worship is so special and it's so unique in the church when we truly worship God. We're directly focused on Him and not ourselves. He delights in us when we worship Him. And number three, or C, if you're keeping up with an outline, we worship because He alone is worthy. Nobody else deserves our praise. God alone is worthy. Psalm 148, the first 13 verses. As I read this, think, who else could we possibly say this about? Who else could we describe with this psalm? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all His hosts. Praise Him sun and moon. Praise Him all you shining stars. Praise Him you highest heavens and you waters above the earth. Let them praise the name of the Lord for He commanded and they were created. And He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above heaven and earth. God alone is worthy of our praise. No one else even comes close. There is no one like our God. Who else is worthy of praise? Who else can make the claims of our God? There's no one. Not in heaven. Someone already tried it. Didn't work out. Not in earth. God alone is worthy of our praise, okay? Let's move on. Number four. Where do we worship? 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul tells us that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, that God is living in us. Verse 19, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Okay, at that moment, when we receive the Holy Spirit, the worship of God expands to any time, any place, under all circumstances. We no longer have to travel to the temple at a prescribed time to commune with God in the Holy of Holies. When you receive Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Okay? When you receive him, it's not a little Jesus that comes and lives inside your heart, right? It's the Holy Spirit. When you submit your life to him, the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. Your body then becomes a living temple of the Holy Spirit. So we now have access and a responsibility to worship God continually in everything that we say and do. Because the temple is now here, right? What an incredible truth that is to grasp. And what a tremendous responsibility we have. We read this last week, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17. It says, rejoice when? Always. On Sunday? No, always. Pray without what? Ceasing. Without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What a marked difference from the old covenant. On this day, go this time to here, sacrifice this, do this, walk in here, holy of holies, right? It, 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 was, a, it was a different, it was a different culture. So, we're thankful for the law. We talked about it last week. Jesus came to fulfill every iota, every dot. We haven't done away with the law. But now we have the temple of God living in us. We no longer have to kill animals and shed animals' blood because Jesus fulfilled the blood once and for all, right? For us. And now he dwells in us. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we should worship God everywhere we go. At all times. In every circumstance. Because he is dwelling within us, right? And finally today, our last point, number five. How do we worship? Okay, let's turn, if, you, if you'd like, to John chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 22 through 24. John 4. Jesus is speaking to a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well when the conversation turns to the subject of worship. And he says to her, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Okay, so again in verse 24, Jesus answers the question, how do we worship? By saying, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That sounds really important, doesn't it? Jesus sounds really emphatic. He repeated himself that we have to worship in spirit and in truth. So what does that mean? The Greek word for spirit in this passage is pneuma. Pneuma refers to the Holy Spirit and it, it also refers to the spirit of truth. Okay? So when Jesus says we must worship in spirit and truth, he's saying we must worship in the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. He precedes that statement by saying that God is spirit, which makes sense then that he follows that with the statement we must Therefore, worship in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Okay, now, here's where this gets interesting. We know that the Holy Spirit dwells within our bodies, right? We read in 1 Corinthians where Paul said that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That must mean then that if we're going to worship in spirit and truth or in the Holy Spirit, that our bodies must somehow be involved in that process. Interestingly enough... When we look at other passages about spiritual worship, that's exactly what we find. 
It turns out that worshiping in spirit and truth isn't simply this transcendent moment of meditation where we sort of rise above our bodies into the spirit realm. It is rather the act of offering our bodies in complete submission to God. The spirit as we worship in the spirit. Okay, turn to Romans 12, or we'll just put it up here quickly. Romans 12, 1. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. If you look at the Greek here, Paul's referring to body and soul. Okay, Old Testament worship involved offering animal sacrifices in the temple. In the Old Testament, there was confidence in the flesh. Paul's saying here that worship now means a living sacrifice because we have new life in Christ. And since the temple is our body, worship now involves giving one's entire life, entire being to God, body and soul. So it isn't one or the other. You see, it's both. Let's read Philippians 3.3. 3. Paul's addressing the church here and he says, For we are the circumcision meaning we're consecrated to him, who worship by the Spirit of God. Again, that's the Holy Spirit. And glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, meaning we completely submit our flesh to the Spirit. John 6, 63, Jesus says, It is the Spirit, that's pneuma, who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit, pneuma, and life. It's both. Earlier we read in Hebrews chapter 10, that if we're to enter into his presence with clean hearts and our bodies washed with pure water. We read in 1 Corinthians 6.20, glorify God in your body. Okay? Simply put, worshiping God in spirit and truth means sacrificially offering our body and soul to the Holy Spirit continuously. It's giving him everything continuously. Rejoicing always. Right? That's a tall order, but that's exactly what Jesus himself said we must do. This is how you are to worship. Body and soul, spirit and in truth. I want it all, all the time. It's so much more than a song. When we worship God, even though we don't feel good physically, that's offering God a living sacrifice. When we raise our hands submissively to God, when we, when we worship, even though we're self-conscious about that, that's a living sacrifice. It isn't a big one, really, but it is. When we intentionally walk away from a sinful relationship, a compromising situation, maybe something unethical at work, and maybe we openly declare, I'm not, I'm not going to take part in that because I worship a holy, righteous God. That is a sacrificial act of worship. That's offering your body as a living sacrifice. That even extends into taking care of our bodies, which... We're trying to do this year, aren't we? We talked about that too. Eating better, being healthier. That's how we worship God. It's giving ourselves over to him completely, but not just in our minds or even just in our hearts. It's both. Also, both. Body and soul. It's physically acting out our worship to God in all that we do, in our once-in-a-lifetime choices, those big choices, and in our little everyday choices. Everything that we do. It's choosing to worship him. This piggybacks right off of last week's sermon on giving. Okay? It's everything. No matter what we're facing. No matter who we're facing. No matter how convenient or inconvenient. It's giving him our all, all the time. The word worship that Jesus uses in John 4 that we just read when he's talking to the woman, woman at the well. When he says worship in spirit and truth, is the word proskuneo in, in the Greek, and it means to kiss the hand or to kneel down in prostration and homage. Okay? Listen, we can choose to kneel before the Lord and worship him by our own volition, or we can stand in defiance before the King of Kings and refuse to honor him for a time. But make no mistake. By the end of this earthly age, no matter how pure or how vile we've lived this life, no matter how straight or how crooked we've walked our path, no matter the lives we've plucked from the fire or the destruction we've wrought in the lives of others around us, no matter how good we seem in our own eyes or how debased we may have lived, listen to me, one way or the other, we will all worship him. 
Romans 14, 10, and 11. It says, For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue confess to God. I know most of you. I don't know all of you. And I certainly don't know where all of you are with God today. But I can tell you unequivocally that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay? So in conclusion, this morning, and as the worship team comes, we're going to prepare for communion. I just want to read Philippians 3. If you want to turn there, one last passage. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Philippians. This passage paints a very practical picture of what it means to live a daily life of worship to God. Okay? Philippians 3, chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brothers, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteous under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's sold out, sold out living for God right there. That is worshiping him with everything I have. Paul knew what it meant to live a daily life of worship, okay? I think we know it too. But knowing and doing are two different things. So the challenge is for us to challenge one another. Encourage one another. It's how we build each other up. To live a life that is daily devoted to worship in spirit and in truth. Okay? And before we leave, I'd like for us to respond to this message. What we've heard today by a corporate act of worship sharing in the Lord's table in the Eucharist, the communion. I can't think of a, of a better way to corporately worship God than by sharing in his table. It's a tremendous act of worship. When we do that, we pause. We, we sacrifice our time and our will to remember and recognize his sacrifice and acknowledge his will. Okay, so if you would, would you stand with me this morning?